leadership, we want to take today, we want to take a look at what are the forces of character that make someone a great leader. And why is it that some people have all the opportunities, but yet never make it happen? Welcome to Leadership and Loyalty Tips for Executives. My name is Dove Barron. I'm the founder of Full Monty Leadership, and I want to welcome you to this in the series of interviews on Full Monty Leadership. Okay, if you're a new listener, we want to thank you for joining us. Strap yourself in. We're about to go Full Monty. And if you're a regular listener, thank you for joining us. Thank you for making us the number one podcast for Fortune 500 listeners, for human resources, family business, and next-gen leadership. Thank you for sharing the show with everyone that you know. Remember, as always, we need you to help us stay relevant, keep others engaged. So please go to iTunes, rate, review, and subscribe to the show. All right, let's strip it down and dive right in. My guest today is a man of significant achievements in uh, quite a few different realms, and you'll see that in a minute. Moreover, he's a man of great character. He's written several books, including a book called Rules of Engagement, Finding Faith and Purpose in a Disconnected World. He wrote his autobiography, It Takes Commitment, and his name is Chad Hennings. I'm going to introduce you to him in a moment. He's also the author of his latest book, which is called Forces of Character. Now, you, that name may sort of rattle around in your brain a bit, and you go, I don't really know that name. Well, you probably do, particularly if you're from uh, the United States. I know that many, we have many listeners around the world. He was best known as a defensive man, a defensive tackle guy from the Dallas Cowboys, you know, that place with all the nice dancing girls. Uh, <laughs> He had a string of successes that began long before his professional football career. He chose to attend the uh, Air Force Academy and play football despite being offered athletic scholarships to many schools. In 1987, his senior year at Air Force, he also received the Outland Trophy, giving him the, the country's outstanding lineman. Because of his remarkable accomplishments, he was elected to the GTE Acad Acad <laughs> my mouth. Academic All-American Hall of Fame in 1999 and the College Football Hall of Fame in 2006. Although he was drafted to the Dallas Cowboys in 1988, Chad postponed his entry into the, into the National Football League, and, you know, there isn't many guys who would do that, you think about it, to fulfill his commitment to the Air Force. He entered into the Euro-NATO program, and began a program, training program to become one of the top pilots and found himself at the controls of an A-10 Thunderbolt with the nickname of Warthog. And we will find out how he got that name. Uh, <laughs> in Forces of Character, this, his new book, he has conversations about building a life of impact. He sat down with 10 extraordinary individuals, some who are famous and some not so much, to discover the moments the mentors and the mindsets that transformed their lives. He's here today to share with us what are the forces of character. So please put your hands together and welcome Mr. Chad Hennings. Woo! Welcome, Chad. <laughs> Thank you for having me on. It's great to have you here, mate. So, so first of all, let's t tell us how did you come to write this book? You've written, you know, this is your, this is your third book, right? Yes, correct. So, so how did you come to write this one? Because this one is a little different. It's it's requiring you to sit down with others, and you know, the impetus to 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 look for these character pieces. What was the impetus for that for you? You know, every time that I would uh, open up a newspaper, listen to a broadcast on the radio, or watch something on the news, or just in life in general, having conversation with friends and family you'd always hear stories of either politicians, athletes, businessmen that were skirting the issues, trying to circumvent the system to try and be an individual where they didn't show character, integrity, morals, core values, et cetera. And, and I began to see how this had a big impact on my kids, you know, on the up and coming, the millennial generation, where, there, where are the role models? Right. You know, if one, in essence, the media, you know, whatever, uh, bleeds it leads right you got it. and that's where they don't highlight stories of individuals that are doing things the right way so i wanted to kind of start that conversation and and i look through my life and those individuals male female black white all raised different from different economic backgrounds of individuals that have done it the right way right. that have a transformational moment that you know character is essential and 
and how they went on and utilized that that identity to be a force of character and impact others. And that's what you know the whole aspect of book forces of character is about is just to that to sh- highlight those stories that character is ubiquitous. Right. You don't have to go to school. You don't have to take a class. It's a lifestyle. It's a choice. So so how do you let's get into that for a moment? How do you define character? Because you know that's a question. I, I can. Uh, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these interviews um, as a leadership guy myself, you know, working with companies and organizations, that piece character comes up a lot. And it, and it seems to be that it's defined differently by different people. How do you define character? Well, I'll, first of all, define, you know, to me, a force of character, someone who lives to be their best self every day, right. um, encourages others to do the same. And then, that organization, that association, that team that they're affiliated with, that could be your family, that could be you know an athletic team, it could be your business, it could be your church, whoever, yeah. encouraging those people to rise to a higher noble purpose or cause. Right. So it's that old servant aspect of servant leadership to do unto others as you do unto to yourself. But you know, character has many different traits or strengths, everything from you know work ethic, self-discipline, resiliency, responsibility. Uh, cur- courage to fairness, justice, truthfulness, integrity, humility, all these different things. But bottom line is, is a person, it's an individual who, you know, tries to do the right thing and encourage others to do the same. So when you, you know, you, you said that, that a lot of the people you interviewed were from various backgrounds, you know, socioeconomic, race, you know, whatever it might be. And one of the things you, you, you say in the book is people don't simply wake up one morning and decide to go rob a bank just so you don't roll out of bed one day and open, you know, and open a homeless shelter. So you said that in the book. So what is it? Because, you know, we see people of privilege, uh, and I mean that not in a, in a disrespectful manner. I mean, people who've grown up with plenty of opportunities who don't step into their greatness, that's the term I would use, they don't step into being, as you would say, a force of character. Um, What is the difference between, from your point of view, those people, why they don't step in versus somebody who does? You know, bottom line, it comes to me, it's a choice. Character is a choice. Character is, is kinetic. I talk about character being kinetic because it's, you know, an analogy would be just like you exercise to strengthen your muscles or to strengthen your cardiovascular system or you continue to take continuing education courses to better yourself mentally. Character is no different. Right. It's those decisions that you make day in, day out, the little things in life that ultimately discern whether you're going to reach that your ultimate potential. So it's it's a decision. It's a choice. But you know, why don't people, in your point, from your point of view, from what you understand, why don't certain people make that choice? Again, they've given all kinds of opportunities. I understand everybody has challenges, but why in your why from you believe that some people make that choice whereas others don't? I think it's it's uh, narcissism. <laughs> Bottom line is what it comes to, where it's not about it's about the me and not about the we. Okay. It's about how to just concentrating your whole lot in life is how to improve your own lot in life, whether that be materials, money, fame, you know social peer groups that you run around with that you don't take into the consideration of, you know, a lot of the short term, how I can improve myself today. And they don't have that long term vision as to what are my thoughts, my words, my actions, how they're going to impact, you know, my, not only myself, but those around me. And I, I mean, a lot of your listeners have, maybe you've had an athletic experience. You've been around those teammates that it's, Hey, I just want the ball to shoot the basket, get as many points to pump up myself. But, you know, in the long run, those people are not good teammates. And ultimately, I had a coach of mine that said, and it's a total redneck saying, he said, it only catches up to you when it catches up to you, right. and it always catches up to you. Right. So those people end up, you know, paying a price for that aspect of selfishness and narcissism that eventually, you know, they're not good team players. Now, I'm sure, in, in, you know, because we said that you interviewed a bunch of people for the book, some of whom are famous, some of whom are not so much. So I'm going to play the other side of this for a moment and say, okay, so people listening to you saying, you know, this is all well and good, good stuff, but, you know, you were born with the genetics. You, 
you know, you had what it took to become a pro uh, football player. You were surrounded. The people you've probably met are also somewhat elite. You don't understand what it's like for me. Uh, you don't understand. Uh, I was born into this crappy place. I don't have your genetics. I don't have your opportunities. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you were surrounded by coaches. You were surrounded by people who encouraged you to step into the, to be a force of, of, of of character to be a, to step into your greatness and the people you know were it's different for me and I would say to them it's it's still a choice a lot of times that's a cop out um, I intentionally surrounded myself with those people that were either going to lift me up you know he who walks with wise men will be wise great proverb yep. that you choose you, you're going to be known by your friends and your relationships you know Machiavelli and the prince said it best when he said the best indication of any man's character is by the company in which he keeps Absolutely. so my first question to those people is who are those relationships are your friends lifting you up edifying you building you up or are they dragging you back down into that self pity that self woe you know if, if I can I'd love to share a story with you in that regard yeah. one of the individuals that I interviewed for the book was a survivor of Auschwitz, a female, Dr. Edith Eager. As a young girl, 16 years old, she finds herself on a cattle car with her sister and her mother from Hungary to, to Poland, to Auschwitz. And on along the, the train ride there, her father's already separated from them. Um, her mother kind of holds her hands, her face in her hands and says, Edie, you know, we're not sure what's gonna happen to us. We're not sure where we're gonna go, but always remember, they can't take away from you what you think, what you think about yourself, and who you are as a person. And, you know, and that's at the time, I'm sure she's thinking, you know, why is my mom telling me this? But when they get to Auschwitz, they get off the cattle car, and they come face to face with Dr. Josef Mengele, the angel of death, yep. who's infamous for standing there and just pointing to the left or pointing to the right for those individuals that he came to meet. And he told her mother, you know, you go this way, to her, her and her sister, you go this way. They try to go with their mother, and they, and he said, no, no, dear, go this way. Your mother's going to go take a shower. Well, she did take a shower. She went to the gas chambers, and she was you know, murdered and executed. And Edie, from that day on, had to make a choice in life as to forgive and to go forward because even she was a classically trained ballerina, so she would be selected to perform for Mengele before his dinner and here's the guy who murdered her family, murdered her, her, her father, her mother, and, you know, is torturing all these people and seeing it. So she had a choice. She had a choice to forgive and she had a choice to, to continue on with life. And in those extreme circumstances in Auschwitz, where you're just left with the bare essence of what it means to be human to survive, where you still have a choice. I mean, when you take life in that perspective, anybody that grows up on the hard side or, or is had any type of adversity in life or pain, my question to them would be, okay, what's your excuse? You know, we have no excuse. No matter what happens to you in your life, you always have a choice as to how you react. And that's what character is about, how you choose to react. Is it for the positive, for the good, or is it for self-interest and for, you know, bad? We all have a choice. I think that was a, that's a very valid point and great story, so thank you for sharing that. And and I think you're, you're absolutely right. It, it, it is all about choice. Um, and one of the things about this, because of my background and what I do, is those become words. And, and what I mean by that is it becomes a cliche thing, you know, where you can choose something else. And I think that people don't really, and you can, I love your feedback on this. People don't really grasp what that means, that I actually have a choice. From, from my ex experience of this, and I've been doing this more than 30 years, people don't understand that we are programmed, we're conditioned for behaviors. And it's simple, it's not, I'm not talking about this horrible force that's, you know, <laughs> that's brainwashing us. I don't we brainwash ourselves on a daily basis with the shit we tell ourselves, and we, we tell ourselves terrible things about ourselves, and we pull ourselves down, and, <clears throat> and so it appears, and that's in quotes again, it appears that we don't have a choice. We, it just seems, well, this is just the way it is. And I think that the key piece is something you said, or something I speak about enormously as well, and I think is vital, is I don't think you do have a choice if you keep yourself in the same environment. 
And I think that that willingness to say, I need to surround myself with people who don't think the way I've been thinking, and I'm willing to be really uncomfortable and look like an idiot, and I'm willing to, to say, I don't know, which is one of the greatest fears of human beings, is to say, I don't know. But actually say, I don't know, and I need to know, and will you support me in lifting me up, and I will do the work. I don't, th like, that is a piece that is like, that's the, for me, that's the leap, is, is, is the realization that the choice only comes from embracing the discomfort of leaving behind the familiar. Hey, hey Amen. And I can't tell you, I mean, you brought up a lot of different thoughts for me on this one, you know, but for the one aspect of, of people that um, you, you talk about wisdom, a lot of the ancients from Aristotle on up talked about what is wisdom. Wisdom is basically acknowledging that you don't know everything, Exactly. you know, and, and take comfort in that. But again, it's, if you're an individual that's, that struggles with an addiction or struggles with a current mind, mindset that, um, and you continue to hang out with those people, if you're an alcoholic or a heroin addict, you don't continue to go hang out in the bars or the party scene because it's going to continue to bring you down. I mean, that's, to me, that's common sense. You know, first you have to get, get help and acknowledge where you are. But for me, Doug, in, in my experience in my life, I have learned more through pain and suffering and turmoil and strife and obstacles that I've had to overcome than I've had through any Super Bowl victory that I've ever won or any uh, business. No growth in comfort. Amen. It's it no is. growth in comfort. Um, and, right. and we all want it. I mean, hey, I'm not turning it away. I like comfort. I like the good stuff that shows up. But the truth is, as you said, the growth comes out of the adversity. And, well, and, that, is, and for me, and you know, because you're talking about choice, but for me, that adversity, what it is ultimately you know, you can say, you know, we hear the, the, the cliches, oh, it's a lesson. Well, uh, okay, it is. But ultimately, the adversity is a presentation of a choice. Do I go back, circle back, do the same crap again, and put myself into this situation again? Because I always say, uh, my analogy is the egg. That, you know, um, Khalil Gibran said that um, my pain is the cracking of the shell of my understanding. And I just love that quote. And, and it's like, it's cracking open. And what most people are uh, busy doing is spackling the, the crack instead of tearing it down and going, okay, what's inside? And that, that, that adversity is the place of the very thing you're talking about, choice. The choice for the familiar or the choice to embrace the discomfort that will give us what you're talking about here, character. The, the, and not this cliche nonsense about what oh, he's a man of character. Who cares? Like character is something you have to know within yourself. That the willingness, I'm gonna do what it freaking takes. Hey Amen. I you know I talk about it. It's an identity. You know, and I I talk about to my kids when I was trying to teach them the aspect of character. It, it was the aspect of ownership. You have a choice. You have to own who you are. When that adversity hits, who do you choose to be? And and I agree wholeheartedly with you on that, that pain and, and suffering. And I, it reminds me of a quote by Rick, a pastor, Rick Warren, um, who always talked about that in life, you know, is it the high, high highs or the low, low lows? Do they operate uh, at different periods of time? But it, no, they, they happen simultaneously. In life, you walk a parallel path that you have victories and you have adversity all on the same path at the same period of time. And, and that's what life is. And, that's what and it's, you, is, you know, so make you, lemonade out of lemons. Yeah, I mean, but, it's, but, it's a choice. But again, for me, here's the thing. And I'm sure you know this too. And I'm sure you've been around these people. Because I think we, that's part of the, the evolution of character is that we recognize, oh, I can't have that. That's not for me. And it's not that you're bad. It just doesn't work for me, whoever that is or whatever it is. And I think that most people live their life in, in what I call the, the numb zone. This is my term. They live in the numb zone. They live in this this band of where everything is okay. Don't rock the freaking boat. Let's keep everything all right. And let's just nod and say yes, but not let not actually have any balls about anything. And the reason for that is because the reason they live there is not that they don't desire the highs. Of course they desire the highs. Of course they do. But they're not willing to go to the lows. 
And that bend only widens if you go down into the depths and you feel the pain and you do what you need to do that gives you the, the, the height of the other side. And this is what is missing. You can't have character in the numb zone. Well, in, in our society's you know, statistics and surveys prove that. We're the most heavily medicated society from a psychological depression standpoint. People don't want to face their the downside or the pain. So they choose to either self-medicate to spackle, put a Band-Aid on it, to your analogy. Yeah. And, and you're right. You're never going to get beyond that point in life until you're willing to face up. So it, it is. We, we have to be courageous you know, as a society t- to face those, that adversity and, and people, that's why I love hanging out with people in the military or athletes, because in the physical world, the realm, they've had to overcome uh, a, a physical aspect of, of adversity to, to face that pain, to break through that wall, to either get into better shape or condition. And that same lesson in life, it's a universal truth. It's the same thing in, in regards to character or to your, your, our, uh, you know, your mindset. Do you have a fixed mindset or a growth mindset? Yeah. And, and it just, it resonates. Yeah, I, don't, I don't know if you've seen this, and I don't, uh, by the way, there's no pressure. I don't know if you've seen this, but uh, one of the things that I do, and you find them on YouTube for those of you watching in case you don't know, is I do what's called sweaty leadership tips. And the sweaty leadership tips are... It usually happens while I'm in the gym, hence sweaty, because um, I've been I've been a gym rat, and among other things, you know, martial arts, boxing, and and a bodybuilder for whew, uh, almost forty years, thirty nine years. My God, that makes me sound old. Uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I've been doing that, and, and so these insights come to me, and the insights are always related to working out. That leadership and working out is same same thing. And it's, as you're saying, it's that mindset to push through. Well, you know, I'm, I'm in the gym. I'm not really in the mood. Well, guess what? Try doing that in life. That don't work. You know, oh, you know I'm, not, I'm not really in the mood to be a dad today. I'm not really in the mood to be, a, to, to, to be a boss today. I'm not really in the mood to be a husband today. Oh, see how that works out for you. <laughs> yeah. Well, and exactly. And I guess another experience that I had, I, I grew up on a farm in Iowa. Our, on a family farm that had been in our family for 125 plus years now, where I watched my father, my grandfather work the land. You know, they were men. They didn't, you know, they weren't very verbally trucking that where they talked a lot, but I watched their actions. And, and from a, any of your listeners that grew up and had an agricultural experience, if you didn't feel to your point, like you wanted to get up and if you didn't, little sick or you just didn't weren't in the mood who is going to do the chores who's going to feed the livestock plant the corn or the soybeans or or do the work you had to do it to survive and that's you know and i can see that analogy that you're making in in the working out in the gym it, it pushes you beyond you know where you think you are at that in, in, you know, individual time in your life because the key is yes okay you know I like the farm analogy. Um, If I don't get up and and feed the livestock, who's going to do it? If I don't get up and do my chores, who's going to do it? However, that may be a discipline, but it's not character. For me, character's this. Nobody needs to take care of the livestock. There's nothing. Everything's going to be fine if I don't do it. Screw it. I still got to get up and do it. That's character. That's the moment when you go, no, this isn't about desperation. This is about a journey. This is about my purpose. This is about why I'm here on the freaking planet. You're right. And it's, it's a discipline. It's a life. It's a lifestyle choice. And discipline does play a part in that too. Cause you have to make the choice. Yeah, but for me, to- and again, I've spoken about this many times too. Discipline for me is a fallacy. What it really is, is I've made this that important. It's not like I've got to discipline myself to do this because I end up feeling resentful. But rather, I'm on fire with this. This freaking matters. This is vitally important. I don't get up and think, I should tell my wife I love her today because that's, you know, I need to be disciplined about showing affection. Uh, You know, that's not going to work because guess what? My wife's not daft and she's going to work out, you know, you're a freaking tape recorder just repeating nonsense as opposed to, I adore my wife and I want to let her know how valuable she is in my life. And it's that important that no matter how crazy busy I am, no matter what's going on in my schedule, I am not going to miss one single day, multiple times a day, telling her I love her because that matters. 
And it, that's what I'm saying about this character is like getting, and every one of you, uh, the listeners have got to get this. You've got to get what it is for you. You've got to get what it is that will give. Like I think, I think you said it really well. It's ubiquitous. Character is ubiquitous. It's there already. You got to make a choice to tap into it. But the choice has to come out of this desire to be something more, to do something more, to be part of something more, something bigger, better, greater than yourself. You may disagree completely. <laughs> no, no, I, I, I totally agree. And that's, you know, in the book Forces of Character, you mentioned some of the individuals I've talked with, people that people would know, Roger Staubach, Hall of Fame quarterback, you know, uh, co-chairman of the board for Jones Lang LaSalle Real Estate now, rock star, former, you know, Navy, Naval Academy graduate, Troy Aikman, uh, Jason Garrett, coach for the Cowboys, Greg Popovich, coach for the San Antonio Spurs, Supreme Court Justice Clarence Thomas, you know, Dr. Eager, the Auschwitz survivor, I've interviewed an, an astronaut, a shuttle commander, Tom Hendricks, the CEO for the National Center on Fathering, um, a homelessness expert, Bob Sweeney, as well as an international human rights attorney from communist Romania, uh, Virginia Prodan. Broad demographic, everybody. And it is to prove that, that character is ubiquitous, that these people, they had a choice. And some of these stories were just, you know, at, at times heartbreaking sure. from their experiences that they had growing up, but they made a choice. They had a transformational time to be that individual like we've been discussing, individual character where I know I have a higher purpose, a higher calling, and I want to encourage other people to do that. So I'm making a choice to live my life this way. And the impact that these people have had on on, uh, on so many people in their in, our, in their lives is is just remarkable, and they're an inspiration to me, you know, every day. But, but again, that's, that's the thing. Every day. So the character piece is every day. It's it's the day when you you don't really need to do it, but you're still going to be that way. And 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 that then you, then it becomes ingrained. It becomes part of who you are. And that and again, that's driven by something mattering more for any one of us. How do you? I'm going to bring up something that's, um, and you've probably already been asked about it, but you know that you were in football. Well, I, I'm going to say handball because I'm not from here. Because um, for me, football would involve your feet. Um, <laughs> it's a weird concept for me, but there we are. So you were involved in that, and, you know, actually, it might actually be called headball because it's a bunch of guys, you know, who are built charging each other and you know not many come out academically you know a lot of them get damaged and hurt and in those situations there's that drive you know so they've got that drive for to be to be great it's often i i, I would suggest that in any of those things there's often a, a level of narcissism in that you know this is about me and i'm going to be great and you know, i was having a discussion i would really like your input on this because i had a discussion with somebody the other day now, I'm an athlete. I've been an athlete all my life. And I said, you know, we were having this discussion about Will Smith playing this doctor in the movie Concussion. And I said, but let, let's, just, let's, just, let's just do something here for a minute. And he said, what? I said, I want you to remember, can you remember, this is my, my training partner, he's, the guy is brilliant with bodies, understands it. I said, let, let's remember when we were 25. And he goes, okay. Now, we've been bolt lifting and training since our late teens. So you remember being 25? I said, yeah. I said, now I want you to imagine that somebody offers you the opportunity to be in a multi-million dollar sport where you can become a superstar. It's not guaranteed, but you could become a superstar. And they said to you, but you could end up with a brain injury. Would you take it? Not now, not the guy you are now in your 50s, but the guy you were at 25. And he goes, in a moment. Tell me, I'd really like to hear this from somebody who's been in that world, and you're now, you know, you're at the other end, you've gone out, you've done other things, you've, you know, you're, you're making a difference, which is wonderful. How do, how do you, if, you, if, I'm, if you're sitting down talking about, as a guy who's talking about the forces of character, how do you talk to that 18, 19, you know, early 20 guy who has just been presented with that choice? How would you talk to him? You know, you you just basically referenced it was a psychological study where they asked Olympic athletes that same question. If we could guarantee you, you would get a gold medal by taking this drug 
or this performance enhancing drug, but you are going to pass, you're going to be deceased at the age of 40, 45. Would you still do it? And the majority of the people said that the athletes said, yes, they would, you know, and that's kind of that whole aspect of, you know, competition, who we are is, is in our culture. But what I would tell that young man is, you know, is to go for it. You know, seriously, that in life, we all take risks. You have to take calculated risks. I was a fighter pilot. I flew combat missions. I knew the risks going into it, but I thought it was something that was valuable, that I was, had an opportunity to serve, to serve my country, but knowing, knowingly putting myself into harm's way that something could bad happen to me, whether it's a training mission or, or a combat mission. Sure. Same thing in football. When you go out and you play football or any sport, you know that there's an opportunity for, for injury, whether that be you know, tear, tore ligament in your leg, whether that be a concussion, whether that be a fractured bone, whatever, but you're willing to take the risks. And up until, you know, without going off on a tangent regarding football, um, do concussions, does the uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy CT happen? Yes, it does. But I take it to the point that there's 70,000 young men that play college football today, that there's over a million plus that play high school as well as select Babe Ruth uh, rec football. And if concussions and CT were such an issue, then we'd have be having a lot more walking zombies around that it's just the concussion protocols that they have today identify those people and it's taking it out of the hands of the coach and the player to evaluate that person to not put them into harm's way because it's the second concussion that you get it's not necessarily the first one but if you go back in and you get injured again before your brain has had the opportunity to heal you don't and and this is the thing too i i work a lot with the center for brain health at the university of dallas here in in texas in in the dallas area and the ut university of texas at dallas and the research indicating today is that the brain heals itself. Just as a sprained ankle or a ligament or muscle, the brain can heal itself. Yeah. So it's not, you know, the, the return on investment for your business people is still high. Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater and condemn football and, and moms not wanting their young men. I mean, I, in my opinion, we try to emasculate young men so much that we need our young men to be men, to stand up. It's okay to get dirty. It's okay to have that, you know, scuffle in the playground. It's okay to play football to hit somebody because that's what men do. I mean, that's, that's testosterone. That's who we are as men. It's okay to compete. And football is a great sport. I can't, to me, football is the best leadership laboratory there is to learn these lessons of character, sacrifice, perseverance, commitment, how to play well with others in the confines of a team. What's your role? All these life lessons, you know, there's nothing like football, in my opinion. Right. So I got off on a tangent, Dub. I'm sorry, but, no, but no, it, it's okay. I asked you because, because I fully expected you to go off on a tangent. That is your history. That was that was your lead in. Um, and at the same time, you know, we can't ignore, and, and you know, it's a fair argument that we can't ignore even a small percentage of, of ex-football players who go from being extremely wealthy and successful to broke, homeless um and suiciding because of because and they of have brain injury. They, well, not necessarily the brain injury, that, that but, but in the 90s, the uh, NFL did a study, the NFL Players Association did a study that interviewed a number of players, and they found that within a year to 18 months after the individual left professional football, a high percentage of these guys were bankrupt, yep. divorced, with no prospects for a future. And again... That's a, that, 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 but that comes to exactly our point. That's a lack of character. Exactly. Stardom, but not character. The same, the same research has been done with pro athletes, period. Yeah. And, and pro athletes are notorious for, you know, because it feels, you know, it's part of that horseshit mon uh, uh, immortality thing we have in our youth. You know, it's going to last forever, whatever it is. And it isn't. And until we get that intelligence to understand that, if it goes away, you know, particularly in a sport where there's a, a, tra a tragic injury that you're suddenly taken out, if you're identified as a psychology, if you're identified with being whatever it is, and then suddenly that's gone away. You're right. And that's, that's here it is. You hit the nail on the head 
ultimately for me is that person's identity. I ask, you know, you ask me, Dove, Chad Hennings, who are you? You know, the typical young male would say, hey, I'm a football player. Right. Or I'm, I'm a fighter pilot. Or I'm a, I'm a teacher. I'm a coach. Or whatever. No, that's what you do. It's not who you are. You got it. And that identity thing is, is where a lot of young men today, because we get our identity from our parents, particularly, I'm going to go way off here on it too. It takes a mother and a father to raise a family, mm-hmm. to raise children. They get the, both the masculine as well as the feminine. The masculine they would get is their identity, their character, morality from the father. They get it too from the mother, but they get mother, they get empathy, they get emotion, they get feeling how you know to love. They get it mutual from both parents. You take one of those away and you look at a large demographic, and I'll just to be brutally honest here with the African-American population, where they have over 70% of the kids are growing up in single parent families and most likely without a father. They're missing out on that identity as to who they are as as individuals. And they need, you know, this is the beauty of athletics is that a lot of times coaches can fill that in for that role. But, you know, they're not equipped to teach character either. And that's one of the reasons why I wrote the book. And why I want to do more is to give individuals the tools that they can be a great mentor to talk to these kids about what you and I are discussing or having is that it's not the things that you do that define you. It, you're, what defines you is a choice. Are you making good decisions? Are you around great relationships with your friends? You know, are, are you resilient? Do you have the perseverance? You know, what it means to be a good human being than just more so than the X's and O's of what it means to be a great football player on the field. There's an important piece in what you said there, which is, it's, you know, I can get off on a political rant too here about African Americans and not them growing up without fathers because the political system is screwed and is putting their dads in jail. You know, th- we can have that political conversation that maybe on another day. That's not for him. But the point here for me is. I don't care what color you are, what race you are. Um, I actually don't even care if you come from from, from uh, same-sex parents. The fact of the matter is that we, so forgetting what, what that kid grew up in, we, people of character, men and women of character, have a responsibility that goes beyond our job. And that responsibility is to understand something. And it's a, I'm fierce about this. Understand something, that every single day you are a teacher. Not when you stand in a classroom, not when you coach the team, but when you get out of bed, when you go back to bed. Every minute of your day, you're you're teaching, you are modeling what it means to be a human being. And if you're a shitty human being, that's what you're teaching people to be. And it's not about male or female, it's about crappy or empowering or powerful, you know, what is it you are, and this is a question I want to challenge everybody on, you know, particularly people are going to, I want them to go get your book, I want them to learn about characters, it's important, but but as you do that, you better stop for a minute and go, hold on a second, yeah, I'm going to get all this character and I can choose that character, but i got to get, in order to actually not just read the information, because who gives a crap, information's worth nothing, it's the application, Amen. and until I stop and go, okay, how do I want to live? What is the model I want to live? How, what do I want them to say about me when I die? Not from the pulpit, because from the pulpit, everybody's canonized. You die and everybody becomes Saint somebody. But actually, what will they whisper in the pews? Will they whisper in the pews as they say up there what a wonderful man he was? He was actually kind of a dick. Or will they say from the, from the pulpit, he was a man, she was a woman of great integrity, of great courage of great character and in the pews they'll be saying can i hear an amen amen that's a choice yeah, really you know and that's this is a another great just quick story um i mentioned i interviewed clarence thomas supreme court justice clarence thomas he grew up you know single parent family also uh his, their home burned down he's homeless for a period of time he and his brother went to live with his grandfather right. and the best this is the best piece of advice i can have give to any father, any individual, he said, his grandfather told he and his brother, he said, boys, if you want to know what to do in life, just watch me. Just watch me. Now, now think about that. It's not do as I say, it's watch me. Watch how I interact with people. You know, watch how I, you know, the actions that I take, the words that I say, that made a difference. And, and kids today, you know, millennials and, and younger, 
they're constantly bombarded with so much social information. They got a fairly, fairly sophisticated filter system where they can detect, you know, BS and, and authenticity and transparency that um, you're never going to teach anybody anything about life or character in a classroom by putting people through a seminar. It's practical application where you're getting their ownership where they make a choice. I choose, I do want to be an individual of character. Help me. Okay, I'll help you be accountable. And that's, you know, it can be done. So any of your people in your business people that are listening to this podcast, it can be done, but you have to be committed to it. But most importantly, if you're in that C-suite, that leadership, it's not something that's going to be a top. You have to, you have to live it yourself. You have to have the buy-in and, and be transparent and do it yourself because your employees will see that and say, oh, this is just another program that we're being forced to force fed. That's like you made it onto the team. And you made it on the team. Are you all about you? Are you all about you being the diva? Are you about all you being the superstar? Are you actually going to play for the team? You know, there's a great story of uh, Michael Jordan uh, working with his coach, Phil, who just slipped out of my head for a second. What was his coach's name? Phil... Yeah. <laughs> we both. No, oh, no. It, but never mind. I, you know, I, I, his, coach, I, I, his coach said to I mean, he was a superstar. And his coach said to him, I want you to pull back. I don't want you to be scoring something. I want you to pull back. And he took Michael from being a diva to being a team player. And they went on to win more championships than they'd ever done before. But Michael had to trust his leader enough to say, I don't have to be a diva to win. And I think that that's a piece that we've got to get. So the, you get to the C-suite and you go, oh, I made it. And I'm, you know, I, I'm on the team. I'm, I'm the Dallas Cowboys of, foot, uh, of, of business. Yeah, you know what? you got to play for the team, mate. If you're not going to play for the team, that you're not on the team. And that is that piece that you're talking about that I think we've got to get. Is You can't assume because you've got the title, you're already there. You know, and that's... You know, I know you're winding this down, but the Dallas Cowboys in the early 90s, we won three Super Bowls in four years, something that had never been done in the NFL before. The guys in that team were selfless. The guys in that team, it was all about team victories, winning Super Bowls. It wasn't about individual agendas. There was no animosity between us in any phase, offense, defense, special teams. But after we hit that peak, that pinnacle of success, we weren't all, for all operating on the same set of quote unquote core values right. that right. that's when individual agendas stepped in. That's when became ultimately the downfall of that dynasty is became, again, as I said before, more about the, the, the me than about the we yep. and individual agendas tore that team apart. And that's, that's the challenging. It's, I think it's easier to climb that ladder to get to that C-suite than it is to stay there because to stay there means – you have to have, you truly have to know who you are as, as a person, as an individual of character. And, you, and, and as an individual of character, you're not going to know who you are. You've got to be willing to know more, meaning you've got to be constantly willing to say, I don't know. Even what I think I know, maybe I don't. Maybe there's a deeper level. Maybe there's a deeper understanding of this. And, and I think that that, to me, that is one of the great characters, characteristics of a great leader is, is, yeah, I know, but I could know more. Tell me about that. I think I know about that, but tell me more. I want to understand that. Let me see if I can deepen my understanding so that I can be a better person. Yeah, you bet. That willingness to listen is, is definitely a, a character trait. Absolutely. Well, Chad, it's been great having you here. Thank you so much, mate. Please tell our listeners, our viewers, where they can find out more about you, about your books, how to bring you in as a speaker or a trainer for, your, for their organization. Please let us know. You can just go to my website, chadhennings.com. Okay, chadhennings.com. Spell it out yep. one, please. Chad, all one word, C-H-A-D-H-E-N-N-I-N-G-S dot com. That's awesome. Just stick around for a couple minutes while we sign out here. I want to thank you, dear listener, for joining us. I want to thank our guest, Chad. did a great job, and uh, I really encourage you to grab a hold of his book. And again, please don't read it, meaning don't just read it. Actually, put it in action. Use it. Do what it takes to become a person of great character. And if you are serious about embracing the kind of positive disruption that will build a culture 
of fiercely loyal employees who will not only lead, but will become evangelical about your organization while generating 10x engagement and productivity. Reach out to me through full Monty leadership.com fullmontyleadership.com again thank you for joining us here on leadership loyalty tips part of the full monty leadership interview series again my name